Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for who, uh, who have logged on to attend. Um, I, my name is John Lee. I am one of the pain fellows at Stanford. Um, my training is uh, primarily in emergency medicine, and I'm finishing up now on my pain fellowship. Um, I'm doing this talk on low back pain because it is such a common um, medical condition that so many of my patients have gone through. I've, I've seen a number of patients through the pain department, but also through the emergency department with complaints of low back pain. And it's, it's such a common experience that um, most of you, uh, in fact, about 80% have been found to have an episode of low back pain at some point during their lives. And so if you haven't experienced low back pain, um, I'm sure you may have friends or family who have suffered through low back pain. So I'm hoping that you find this lecture regardless. And really a lot of the principles that I'm gonna talk about today um, can be applied to uh, painful conditions outside of low back pain. So hopefully you find this helpful regardless. Um, and so with low back pain, as I mentioned, about 80% of the population will experience it at some point during their lives. Um, it's the second most common cause of disability in the United States. It's a very common reason for lost workdays. An estimated 149 million workdays per year are lost because of low back pain. And total cost estimates in the U.S. Um, are between 100 to $200 billion lost annually to low back pain, uh, two-thirds of which are due to decreased wages and decreased productivity. So with this, uh, with this next slide, I want to introduce you to the overall structure um, that makes up our lower back. Um, this isn't really meant to be a detailed an anatomic course when it comes to our low back, um, but I wanna introduce you briefly to the complexity of these structures and why diagnosis of the root cause of back pain can sometimes be challenging and take some time and take some work. Um, I think understanding very generally these structures of your low back can often help you engage in discussions with your doctors, your physical therapist, and it might help you to better understand some of the treatments that we're offering and recommending. Um, and so I'm hopeful that you'll find this useful. So I have three pictures here. The one on the left outlines our bony anatomy. Um, the one in the middle is our bony anatomy with an overlay of the nerves and our nervous system structures. And lastly, we have uh, our bony anatomy with the musculature that surrounds it and helps support it. So with our first picture, um, you'll see our first structure here in red is our vertebral column. Um, next, we have our pelvis. And lastly, we have our sacroiliac joint. And so this is the, a large joint that connects these two very major structures. Um, this joint um, is often the cause of low back pain, and so many of you might have had injections to this joint, and hopefully um, it might have helped you in the past. Um, next, we have in our middle diagram, um, we have the interlay of our nervous system structures. The first arrow points to our medial branches, which I'll talk to, which I'll talk about a little bit more in depth later. The next is our nerve roots. Um, which are coming out from the spinal column itself. Um, another one that I want to point out is the cluneal nerves, often a point of impingement and can sometimes cause people some pain more in the upper buttock region. And uh, one more structure that might be familiar is the sciatic nerve um, in this last arrow here, um, all of which can be implicated in low back pain. And with the sciatic nerve, um, oftentimes this can cause pain that's going down the leg. Um, so here on our last picture towards the right, we have um, a, a diagram of our muscles and our structures that are supporting our spine. Um, we have the paraspinal lumbar muscles. It's a, it's a broad way of um, grouping together all of the muscles in our back that help support our spine and give us stability as we um, walk and do other activities. Um, next, we have the gluteal muscles. Um, and lastly, you can't see it here, but underneath the gluteal muscles are several other muscles, but one in particular is the piriformis, um, which is often thought to be a cause of pain. 
Um, one interesting thought and, and concept that I wanted to point out is that as humans evolved 10,000 years ago, the early human lifespan was approximately thought to be around 25 to 30 years old. In the past, the early human had a much different way of life. And in today's world, our backs were seeing much different types of workload and of stress. Um, many people have desk jobs requiring positions that our bodies uh, may not have been designed or evolved to hold, such as sitting at a desk for long periods, looking at our phones and tablets or living uh, more sedentary lifestyles uh, with less exercise, less walking. Um, through modern medicine and, and just various changes throughout the years, humans can now live beyond their 80s, 90s, 100 years old. And so our backs, if you think about it, may not have been designed or evolved to last this period of time. And so we often see degenerative findings in people even at the age of 30 and older, okay? And so unlike four-legged animals, our backs also are forced to stand upright to get us to ambulate and move. And so you can imagine the effects of gravity over the years on the basic wear and tear of these complex structures holding us together. Um, as you can see, our, our backs are very complex. The diagnosis for back pain often requires a combination of seeing you in our clinics, examining you, hearing your story, and listening to what um, makes your pain better or worse or seeing exactly where it is. Um, and at times we'll order imaging and at times we'll use diagnostic nerve blocks. Um, as some of you may have experienced, our pain doctors will often do uh, diagnostic blocks. This is where we use x-ray guidance or ultrasound guidance to precisely direct our needle to a particular target structure. Sometimes this is a nerve, sometimes it's a joint, sometimes it's a muscle. It's our hope that through these injections, we can be um, diagnostic, but also therapeutic. Diagnostic in that hopefully we get some answers on whether it was the correct target for you, whether this was helpful for you. Um, and therapeutic meaning, we hope that you get relief from this injection and the amount of relief that you may experience really depends on the type of injection. And there, there are many uh, different types of injections that we offer our patients. So I wanna talk about a particular uh, process that is, is very common and many people might've heard of the term disc herniation or sometimes people will call it, oh, I popped the disc. And so these are common terms that we hear in the community. Um, and it's quite painful for people who might have experienced it. And so I wanna talk a little bit more about this. Um, we typically have five lumbar vertebrae. Each vertebrae um, is separated by a cartilaginous disc. And so that first arrow points to our vertebral body. And so this is a, a bony segment of our spine that helps to support a, a good amount of the, the weight of our trunk and our upper extremities, our head. Um, the next structure here are the facet joints. And so these are bony joints in the back of our spine that also help to support part of the weight of our bodies. Um, this is often a target of our uh, interventions. Sometimes we'll target these nerves specifically that run over these facet joints called the medial branches. And so this is a very common procedure that we do and uh, often it targets the arthritis that might be present on these facet joints. Next, you have your disc. And so these discs, um, I want you to think of it as the shock absorbers. And so they're also there to help increase the flexibility and mobility of our lower backs. Um, with time, these discs can degenerate and they can even bulge and cause compression on nerves that are within the spinal cord or as they exit the spinal cord, which is what you see above in this next arrow. So this nerve is the right L4 nerve. Um, we say L because it's part of the lumbar spine and four because we have, it's the fourth out of five lumbar nerves. And so um, this nerve is getting irritated um, by the bulging disc. And so typically this pain will present as a pain going from the back to the lower extremity. And this arrow here uh, demarcated by the lines and the number L4 uh, demarcates the area of very typical pain for L4. Overall, this is an uh, explanation of how a disc herniation uh, may present in the simplest, most predictable way. 
Um, but I do want you to realize that not everyone will have the same symptoms that can be explained by a single pinched nerve. Oftentimes it's more complicated than that. Uh, bony arthritis, think in ligaments of the spine, fatty deposits in the epidural region. Sometimes this can cause tightening of the spinal cord, uh, the nerve roots on more than one side, more than one level. And so oftentimes the pain won't be as predictable as I pointed out above. Also, if you realize that you have an MRI report that says you might have a herniated disc or mentions a pinched nerve, it doesn't always mean you have pain. So it's not something to worry about um, if you don't have a, a pain to the lower extremities. Uh, it's actually a very common that we find a common finding that we see incidentally when we obtain MRIs at times. So this um, next slide is a very brief overview of a few of the most common imaging modalities that we use to assess your low back. And so um, ultimately deciding which one you need or if you need any at all should really be with discussion with your pain doctor, your primary care doctor, your surgeon. Um, not everyone needs imaging and this is often a complex decision that we're trained to make after hearing about your back pain and examining you. And so we don't always necessarily need imaging in order to determine uh, the appropriate course of treatment for you. Um, but I think it's a good idea to have a, a basic understanding of what the different modalities are and what are their advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so x-ray. So I want you to think of this as a snapshot of your bony anatomy. It's really good at determining the overall shape of your spine, also known as scoliosis. Um, also the degree of arthritis, it, it is pretty helpful for that. We're able to see your entire spine in just one picture. Um, and it gives us a really good understanding of your spine. The benefit is also that we can do these images in flexion and extension. And so by doing that, we call this dynamic views. It allows us to see if different positions might affect your spine. Um, this isn't really possible with a CAT scan or MRI, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, and so this is a big advantage of the x-ray. Lastly, this is something that we could obtain pretty quickly, sometimes even on the same day as your appointment if you see us in pain clinic. The downside to the x-ray is that we often can't see your soft tissues, such as the muscles, the ligaments, the nerves, anything that isn't bone really. Um, there's also some degree of radiation, although not as much as a CAT scan. So the CAT scan is next. A CAT scan or CT scan, uh, the full name would be a computerized tomography. Um, this is really good at getting detailed views of your bony structures. They're pretty decent at looking at the soft tissue, unlike x-rays, um, but not quite as good as an MRI. This is often done in the emergency department because it's really good at seeing if you've developed any fractures or if there are any major emergent conditions that we need to deal with quickly. This modality's imaging is also, um, it does involve radiation, as I mentioned above, and generally to a higher degree than x-rays. Lastly, we have the MRI. And so I would say this is probably the most advanced form of imaging that we have. Um, it can give us very detailed views of the soft tissues, the nerves, the ligaments, and we can often see the bony structures pretty well too. The downside, um, there are a few challenges. Some, if you do have metal in your body, that could make things a little bit challenging. Um, one, the metal can degrade the images of the MRI, and that's true for CAT scans too. Um, most medical implants, such as pacemakers or surgical hardware, uh, most of the manufacturers have designed these implants to be compatible with an MRI, meaning you won't be harmed if you do. Um, however, at times you may have to deactivate your device or reprogram it if you do obtain an MRI. So always make sure um, with your device manufacturer, whether it is compatible and whether you need to do anything specific if you are gonna get an MRI in terms of reprogramming the device or turning it off for a brief period. Not all medical implants are MRI compatible. So you should always check with your doctor and your device manufacturer. Um, in general, for lower back pain without any major emergent or concerning 
symptoms, which I, I will talk about on our next slide, we usually recommend at least four to six weeks of conservative therapy before pursuing an MRI. This means physical therapy, home exercise programs, medications, either over the counter or prescribed by your doctor. Uh, the general rule is that if you have an acute episode, meaning a new episode of the low back pain, most of the time, these cases resolve over four to six weeks of conservative therapy. And that's why we generally recommend a round of conservative therapy before pursuing advanced imaging, such as an MRI. If you don't get imaging, just realize that not every detail mentioned in your uh, report by the radiologist means it's the cause of your pain. And you should always talk to your doctor about the importance of the findings mentioned in your MRI. Sometimes we think of MRIs and CTs as um, their job is to provide a diagnosis, but in reality, it's not true. And the diagnosis really comes from a trained clinician who is really able to take the time to talk to you, examine you, and interpret your imaging in the context of, of you, the patient. And so I want to point your attention to the right here where we have these um, little disclaimers. And so you'll see the top one is for under 40, middle is for between 40 and 60, and the last one is for over 60 years old. And so with all the Stanford imaging and our imaging findings, our radiologists actually include these findings. And so I think this is really interesting and important to look at. Um, you'll see it says some imaging findings are common, even in normal pain-free individuals. Among people between the ages of 40 and 60 who do not have back pain, an MRI will find that about eight in 10 have disc degeneration, seven in 10 have disc signal loss or desiccation, six in 10 have disc height loss, six in 10 have a disc bulge, three in 10 have a disc protrusion, three in 10 have an annual fissure. And you'll see that this is even more common for patients over 60 years old. And these are pain-free volunteers who have had the MRIs. So it's always important to talk to your doctor to see if the imaging really matches your exam and, and what uh, pain you're describing to us. So next slide. Um, these are the back pain red flags. And so as an emergency physician, um, I was trained to identify medical emergencies, things that are life, that are limb threatening, that can cause you harm um, in a short period of time. I wanted to include this slide because I think there is some symptoms um, that are important to have awareness of. Um, these are symptoms that I look for in the emergency department when determining if a cause of back pain is emergent or if it warrants prompt attention. Um, it's my hope that by sharing this with you, I can encourage most of you that your back pain is not something that you have to be afraid of and to empower you to know um, what symptoms to look out for um, if things seem to change with your back pain. So first is traumatic injury. If you had a recent traumatic injury and you develop any of the symptoms below, that increases my suspicion that there might be something a little bit more dangerous. And usually by traumatic injury, I mean a pretty significant fall or a car crash, um, something that could result in um, injuries to your bony structures in your spine. Um, neurologic symptoms. Um, so one thing that is common when a nerve is irritated is numbness and tingling and pain. Um, the neurological symptom that I mostly worry about is if you're having lower extremity weakness. Let's say the nerve is being impinged to the point where your nerve is actually having a difficult time sending motor signals telling your legs to move. And so those are always a little bit more concerning. And if you do ever develop those symptoms, uh, it's important to talk to your doctor right away. Um, symptoms of fevers, chills, feeling ill associated with a new back pain, these are symptoms that I would look out for as well. Um, Numbness in the saddle distribution. So if you look on the image to the right, um, we have uh, an area outlined in gray and darker gray in the middle. Um, this is called a saddle anesthesia or the saddle distribution. If you have numbness or tingling in this region, it points to a more sinister area of um, impingement in the spine. Some of you may have uh, symptoms of difficulty bowel with bowel or bladder function. In the context of an injury to a spine that is new, um, if you have new symptoms of 
incontinence of stool or urine, meaning you have a hard time controlling uh, your bowel or bladder movement, um, then that's more concerning. However, there's many different reasons that one can have difficulty controlling their bowel or bladder. Sometimes it has to do with an enlarged prostate. Sometimes it has to do with the pelvic floor muscles. And so this should always be discussed and interpreted by a physician, okay? And so um, I think this is an important topic because uh, we as humans, we've evolved, evolved pain as the danger signal. So we've evolved to correlate pain with danger and it's really just our natural instinct to avoid pain. And this is how we survived and this is how we lived. It's our survival instinct really. So now that we're living much longer, many of us unfortunately have developed chronic pain from our backs and the arthritis that we develop and other changes. For some of us with chronic pain, these danger signals are now with us every single day. And sometimes they scare us. And sometimes they discourage us from movement because we're afraid to make things worse. Um, with chronic pain, sedentary lifestyle is often the wrong answer. It often leads to muscle wasting, to deconditioning. With the help and guidance of your doctor and your physical therapist, our goal is to get you moving and active. And this is why I want you to be aware of the symptoms that are really denote uh, something that's more emergent. We want to be able to teach you what movements and exercises are safe for you to do. And we wanna encourage you to uh, actively participate in rehabilitation. So this is, um, this is an analogy that uh, I've been taught and I like to use for a lot of my patients. And it's the biopsychosocial model for pain and how we approach management. It's a core concept on how we uh, attempt to manage our patient's pain. And I think it's a really holistic method of looking at a patient and determining what they might need. Um, pain is really complex. And oftentimes there's more than a single reason why someone might have pain. And so similarly, our treatment is often complex and we often have different modalities to offer you in terms of treatment. Um, treatment can fall under four categories um, that I like to broadly distribute them in. Um, and we like to use this stool model or chair model, okay? As you can see, there's four legs to this chair. Um, and if you can imagine, a chair can stand balanced on four legs. That's how most chairs are. Uh, and maybe even three legs, but you really can't have a chair with just one or two legs. And so I hope that analogy makes sense is that um, oftentimes with chronic pain, we need more than just one, two interventions or help um, ways that we treat your pain. Um, as your pain physician, I may sometimes recommend medications or I might recommend injections or recommend that you see a particular surgeon or specialist. Um, but I often, almost always will collaborate with my colleagues, the physical therapists, the occupational therapists, as well as our pain psychology team, as well as anyone involved in your mental health, your therapist, your psychiatrist, your primary care doctor, your family members. I think this is all really important in our multidisciplinary approach to helping you. Um, our goal is to really help you to improve your functional goals and to treat you as a whole person in the hopes that we might help with your pain by doing so. And so the first slide, this is one of the legs of the chair that I previously discussed, but um, it's important to always check in on your mental health. Um, there are studies that demonstrate that depression has been associated with disability and worsened recovery in both acute, meaning new, um, and chronic lower back pain. So I want to always encourage you to see your doctor or your therapist if you feel might, you might suffer from depression or any psychiatric illness. There are a lot of treatments available. Um, a lot of it is available through our pain department. Um, sometimes we would recommend medications. Sometimes support groups can be helpful. We have cognitive behavioral therapy. We have our wonderful empowered relief course. Um, and a lot of these resources will actually be outlined at the end if you wanna take a screenshot of it. Um, I do also wanna acknowledge that many patients often become depressed because of their chronic pain. 
And I want to acknowledge that you're not alone. And this actually happens to a lot of people. Chronic pain can be really taxing emotionally and physically. And I hope that I can convince you that no matter what the cause of your depression, it's still important for us to treat it. And um, having worsening symptoms of depression can lead to poor recovery and worsen disability. And so it's always important that we take care of it and address it. Chronic pain is often a long journey rather than a quick fix. Um, rarely do we find a medical treatment that will completely eradicate or fix pain in an instant. Oftentimes it's, it's a much longer journey. And so there's always a chance that with chronic pain, it returns in the future. So we wanna always be able to make sure that we equip you with coping skills, with cognitive tools, with a strong support group. All of that is necessary for you to be able to handle future hurdles that you may face. Um, we also wanna ensure that we care for your mental health as we guide you on this journey towards getting better and uh, towards rehabilitation. Next, so this is another leg of the chair that I mentioned, uh, movement and physical therapy. And so um, there are studies that demonstrate that uh, living a very sedentary life uh, of more than three hours a day can increase the lower back pain that you might experience. And we've seen this through all types of different ages. Um, we've also seen it associated with increased disability levels. So for this reason, it's, it's always encouraged to have a formal physical therapy or occupational therapy evaluation. Um, treatment plans, um, they're often very specifically tailored. Um, and so our, our team of physical therapists, occupational therapists are, are highly trained in talking to you and examining you. Um, and oftentimes their treatment depends on the acuity of your symptoms, meaning is how long has it been going on for? Is this a new thing or is this something that's been around for a while? Um, the pathology, meaning what we think as your team, what we think might be going on. Is this a specific muscle strain? Is this a herniated disc? Is this from arthritis? Um, so our impression of what might be going on also dictates what we might recommend um, in terms of your rehabilitation. And then we also take into account your personal exercise, your flexibility levels. And so it's always important to form a good treatment plan with the physical therapist. Um, and that way you can continue some of the home exercise programs at home. And so really the goal is to get you to keep moving um, and to feel safe in doing that. Um, if you have other hobbies, for example, some people love climbing, dancing, going biking, yoga, swimming. Most of these are probably a good idea to continue. Um, I always recommend that you discuss it with your professional team, your physical therapists, occupational therapists, or physicians. But in general, we want you engaged in the activities that make you happiest and that you're most likely to keep up with. So sleep. Sleep is something I wanna take some time to talk about as well. Um, and so it's always good to check in on your sleep and you might find us asking you questions about your sleep in our surveys and also when you come and see us in clinic. So sleep disturbances, they're often, um, they're very common in patients with lower back pain and they are associated with the intensity of pain that you might experience. Uh, sleep apnea can lead to worsened quality of sleep. Um, so some signs of sleep apnea might include snoring loudly, daytime sleepiness, not feeling refreshed, um, and observed apnea episodes. So that would mean a partner who might see you actually have periods of where you're not breathing and then you wake up to catch up your breath. Some of the treatments um, and tests that we use um, are sleep studies. So sometimes if you see a sleep expert, uh, a sleep physician, um, they might recommend particular types of sleep studies um, these can be take-home tests or they can be in-hospital tests where they evaluate you. And oftentimes they might recommend a CPAP machine, um, which is a little machine that uh, provides a little bit of oxygen support and via some pressure in order to get you breathing more comfortably and sleeping more effectively. Um, you'll see in the top right, these are actually the CDC recommendations for how much sleep you should obtain depending on your age. Um, I would say the common theme is that seven hours is a minimum for all ages above 18. 
And I think um, to be safe, it'd probably be best to aim for at least eight hours as it takes people some time to fall asleep for the most part. And it also accounts for if you do have periods of uh, waking up in the middle of the night, it will account for that. So I think eight hours is my recommendation. Um, there was also a great lecture by one of my colleagues, Dr. Jack Tiani, uh, that um, is posted on YouTube about sleep and chronic pain. So I think this is a great uh, YouTube video to watch if you're interested in learning more about this and the correlation between sleep and chronic pain. One thing I also want to talk about is acupuncture. I think this is one of my um, favorite uh, complementary adjuncts to treating low back pain. Um, and so there have been studies that showed a decrease in disability for patients who received acupuncture for lower back pain. And we also see improved pain scores for people who have received acupuncture. Um, one of our uh, clinic doctors, uh, Dr. Kong, um, is actually a, a very well-known expert in this field, and she's published about this. Um, and so um, I think it's a, a very helpful adjunct to treating your back pain. If you ever need help finding an acupuncturist, you could always reach out to our clinic. We have a, a good list of great acupuncturists in the Bay Area that might be able to help you out, depending on where you live. And lastly, um, I want to talk a little bit about yoga. There have been studies uh, about yoga um, for moderate improvements to back pain related function. Uh, we've also seen improved pain at three and six months when we study this. Um, and I think this can also be a great adjunct to your home exercise programs or your regular exercise routines. Um, ultimately, our goal is to get you moving and and get you engaged in the activities that you enjoy. And so if yoga is, is something you might find interesting, we definitely encourage you to participate and find some local resources. And so that concludes my presentation. Here is a list of some of the resources. Um, you're welcome to take a look at some of these articles if you're interested. Um, through this lecture series, I really hope that uh, I can emphasize that low back pain is really common and that you're not alone. And I hope that I can stress that it is really key to recovery. Um, by uh, it, What is key to recovering from low back pain is having a good multidisciplinary approach to back pain. Um, so thank you for taking the time to tune into our lecture. Mm -hmm.